We know when you say, you call, cry out to the Lord, he hears us and he answers us. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, we're going to jump into the word this morning. Uh, before we do, let's uh, take a moment and pray. We're going to be wrapping up um, uh, what we've been in a, a series for a little, maybe eight weeks, nine, maybe nine weeks, um, called Back to Faith School, or Back to School, Back to Faith School. Uh, and so t- this morning, we're going we're gonna to wrap that up. And uh, I believe it's going to be just what the Lord wants. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for attentive hearts, ears that hear, eyes that see. We thank you that you're speaking to us, that you're speaking. The conversation that you started, Lord, we, uh, we're engaged in what you're saying this morning. We're listening with our hearts. And we're listening to you, what you would speak. We thank you for those words. And we make much of them this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, if you have your Bibles this morning, I would, I would like to start uh, this morning by going to uh, a passage in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 is where we're going to start this morning, uh, 4.16. And this is the uh, passage just talking uh, about Abraham. And we're gonna, the title of this morning's message is this, All the Way to the Finish. All the way to the finish. You know, when, when you go back to school, how many of you know kindergarten's great, but graduating is the goal, right? Uh, not just kindergarten, graduation, right? Uh, graduating is the goal, all the way to the finish. And you know, um, as well as I do in life, there can be some interruptions. Anybody have any, have any interruptions? Like what you set out and you intend to do, you can be interrupted. Uh, and uh, let's... let's uh, Mm, let's read this and then we'll go from here. It says, Romans chapter 4, 16 through 20. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. So here's what God's saying. He wants it to be of faith in our lives. We're going to read about Abraham here just in a moment. But it is of faith that it might be by grace. God's unmerited favor towards us. His kindness towards us. It, he, he's showing. He, we receive that by faith. Okay? We receive the, the goodness of God and we appropriate the grace of God, saving grace. All saving grace in our lives is appropriated by faith. Do you know the Bible tells us that it's God's will that all men be saved? Or in other words, God's extending his grace to all men. But how are all men, how, how is somebody saved? By, by faith. Right? So it's faith that is the extension of grace. We are saved by grace, but through faith, right? So if you don't have that conduit of faith, you can't tap grace. It is, this faith, in a sense, is the bridge between God's portion and us. Faith. That if we don't have that faith, if we don't extend, or, and what is faith? It's coming under the Word of God. That you and I would come under the word of God. Do you and I believe, do you believe that God loved you so much that he wasn't willing to even spare the expense of his son Jesus, but instead he sent Jesus to pay the price for you? God loves you that much. Do you, do you believe that? Can you come under that word that God loves you so much that, that, that he gave his son for you? If you can come under that word, that that's faith. Faith is not try and eking, and faith is not here. Faith is just simply saying, that's right. I'll receive that. I'll come under that word. So it is by, uh, <clears throat> therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Uh, to the end, the promise might be sure to all of his seed. He's talking about Abraham. Any, everyone that comes underneath or, or comes after Abraham. Abraham is the father of our faith. Okay, what does that mean? He is the one that God found all the way back in Genesis that, to believe him. Before there was ever this covenant or, or the law, the Mosaic law, he found a man who believed him in Abraham. And this is how we uh, also get in on Christ. We get in by faith, not by works, not by circumcision, not by anything except for by faith. If you and I will just come under what God says, we can tap the grace portion. So there is saving grace, that which salvation affords. All the good promises in his word, it takes faith to receive them. It takes you and I coming under his word above what we see. It takes you and I stay, not only coming under his word, but how many of you know, sometimes we, we stand underneath the roof, so to speak, uh, uh, underneath the roof of God's word, and we're like, wow, we're dry. But then we come over here, and then we get wet. 
And then we decide we're going to come over here and we come back on, and yet we wonder why we're wet because we, we don't really stand and stay under the word of God. We stay under the word of God and then we're like, yeah, but I don't just don't know. And then we're wet. And then we're coming back over here and, and though we're underneath the roof, so to speak, we're still wet because we went in and we went out. We went in and we went out. Sometimes in our lives, we're wet because we're wishy-washy. That's it. It has nothing to do with, and yet the Bible tells us that when we remain faithless, God remained faithful still. Thank you, thank you, Lord. In other words, that roof remains. Like he's not, that's, it's immovable. God is immovable. He's going to stay there. Whether you and I remain, remain faithless, he says you can come under here and be, and, and be dry anytime you want and be saved. Salvation, all of salvation, right? It's there. He's not moving on that. And so um, let's keep going here. It says, but to those, uh, but to that also which is of faith, of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Before him, um, or as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and calls those things that are not as though they were. So he believed in God. In God. And, this, and, and what we're talking about God, we're talking about the Lord. God the Lord, not just a God, we're talking about God the Lord, who calls those things that are not as though they are. He believed in a, a, the God, the only God, the one who declares the end uh, from the beginning, the one who, who can create something out of nothing. This is who he's talking about, making it really clear, and the God in whom Abraham believed. Let me ask you this, is that the God that you believe? Is this the God that you believe, the one who can raise the dead? Or is, is the God that you believe in maybe a little more limited than that? Is, is the God that you and I believe in the one who can make something out of nothing and calls into being that which does not exist yet? Because is that, that's the God that sent his son Jesus Christ for you and me. The one who calls things that aren't not yet and he calls them into being. The, the God who takes, uh, he can raise life from the dead. He is the God who's not limited in any way, but yet he works in a way. Uh, I say that again. God is not limited in any way, yet he works in a very specific way. He calls things that are not yet as though they are. And this is what Abraham had to come under and, and learn this is what faith is. Calling things that are not as though they are. This morning I read at the beginning here the story of Abraham, just of, of, of how God promised him a child, right? And, and, and it didn't happen. They're, you know, 80, 90 years old at this point. And you get the word from the Lord, I'm going to give you a child uh, for your inheritance. And it didn't work out. So what do they do? They got uh, Hagar, which is Sarai's maidservant. Maidservant, yeah. And they had a, a baby. But the Lord said, nope, that's not how I work. The way I work is with my word. And so at this time, it's, it's not Abraham, it's Abram and Sarai. Yet at this time, before they had Hagar, God took him out. But if you, again, this is Genesis 15. God took him out of the tent and said, look at the stars. I want you to see this is how your descendants are going to be. So they, he let him see some things, right? He let him see some things and said, as the sand on the seashore, this is your descendants will be. So he, as he went out, he, he saw some things. Yet the Lord didn't change his name yet. The Lord didn't change his name until after they, are, they had Hagar. The Lord didn't change Sarah's name or Sarai to Sarah until after they had already had this baby. He said, I need you to work with me. I need you to work with me. And he said, I'm going to change your name. Now you're going to have to say it. And he actually, this is where he also instituted circumcision, and this is in Genesis 17. But he said, I need you to work with me. Your name will no longer be Abraham or Abram. It'll be Abraham. Abra. And that, that, that we add that word H, it's, it's the letter, the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's not an English letter, but it is the way we would say it. Hey. Hey, H-E-Y would be how we would pronounce it in Hebrew. It is the, so when we say Yahweh, it's the two, two of those letters are the, so the, what, what, what Abraham was made aware of, that it's going to be a portion 
in your name that's going to bring it about. It's going to be a spirit portion. It's going to be the breath portion. It, or let me say it this way, because that word, a, the word that we, that's added to his name, the fifth letter, it's going to be that breath portion that's going to bring it about. Or it's going to be by my spirit. It's going to be by my spirit. It's going to be by my word. You're going to be reminded continually that is with you. And this word, huh, this breath is with you, or the word of God is what's going to bring it about. And so he begins to say, he said, you're no longer going to be called Abram. You're going to be called Abraham. Now, here's the question. Here's the question. Who had to call himself Abraham? Did, 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 was God talking to Abram, or did God show up at, a, at, a, at his church service and say, uh, announcement, announcement, I am the Holy One God Almighty, and uh, this is Abram, but he shall no longer be called Abram, he shall be called Abraham. So I want all of you to call him from now on Abraham. Is that how that worked? Did he make an announcement? Did it go out through all the world? Or did he talk to Abram and he said, no longer are you to call yourself Abram. You're to call yourself Abraham. You're to, you're to call yourself that. No longer will you be called. So you had to say, when, 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 when Seth, you're like, uh, hey, Pastor Nate. No, it's not Nate. It's Nathan. Right? That's my name's Nathaniel, actually. But I'm not Nate. I'm Nathan. Or I'm Nathaniel. I had to bring that correction, or I had to make a declaration. No longer. And they would recognize the... How are you going to put a God portion in your name? Because this is how it's going to come about. And then he goes on. This is Genesis 15, or 17 rather, the beginning portion. Then he goes on and he talks to his wife about his wife, Sarai. And he said, no longer will you be called Sarai. Uh, she shall be called Sarah. With the, again, putting the H there. Putting that breath there. It's important, the part that you and I play with the promises of God. Bottom line, bottom line, putting God's word, putting God's word in your and my mouth. This is how, it, it, this is how we get to the finish, all right? So again, the God that you believe in, is he the one that, that, that quickens the dead or raises the dead and calls those things that are not as though they were? Because that's the God in whom Abraham believed. And if you believe in that God, then against hope or against what you see that looks hopeless, you can believe in hope which is the picture that the word of God creates. So against what you see, you can believe in the picture that God, what the word of God creates because you believe in the God who raises the dead and calls those things that are not as though they are. So you can have hope, though it looks hopeless, because you believe in the one who calls the things that you don't see as though they are, so they will be. So this is a powerful thing, all the way to the finish. All the way to the finish, if you're growing tired because you're looking at where you're at, uh, then, then guess what? You, you, you won't finish. But if you and I hold hope because we believe in the one who raises the dead, we believe in the one who calls those things that are not, are not as though they are, then guess what? We can finish. But if we, just as I was talking, I just heard somebody say, you just said that raises from the dead, but that person didn't raise from the dead. So here's what I'm saying is you're... You're not believing in the God who raises from the dead. You're looking at a situation. You're saying this situationally, is God didn't show up in this situation. You're, you're blaming God here or the God that you and I are serving here. That's not him. You're going to have to look at this, what happens. Uh, we're, we, sometimes we're a wait and see people and we've made faith what it's not. We've made faith what it's not. And here's what we did, we've done with faith. We've made faith, we've made faith a tool that is given to us to please us instead of please God. This is what we've done with faith. Faith. To get what you want, to get what you need, to, 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 to grab another promise. And so what, what, what happens is, is we are results-minded rather than God-minded. We're results-minded. We're, check, we're checking on. We're measuring-minded. We'll say it this way. We're critique-minded. We're actually critical of the Lord rather than desiring to please the Lord. Did you know if you were to finish reading about faith in Hebrews 11, he talks about those who stayed in faith, yet they did not see. 
You know what they did? They continued to please God. You know what it says Noah? He built an ark having not seen rain before. He continued. He continued for 100, 100 years, continued to build a boat having not seen. How long can you and I continue to believe God or, 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 or are we just going to quit because, well, it's the end? Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, even on this conversation, because I'm having a conversation right now with somebody about somebody dying right now. This is what somebody died. So, did, so God, did, he's not raising them from the dead? God's not raising them from the dead? So why did we have a funeral and talk about them being in heaven? Why did we have a funeral and why, did, why was that your hope? That they're gonna, you're going to see him in heaven if he's not raising him from the dead. Is he raising him from the dead or not? Where, where, has your, where has your faith lied time? Lied. It, it lies. When I, my faith lies in time. In other words, where from this place to this next place, what happens is, it really, the truth is, I'm, I'm really not in faith. I'm in a wait and see. And if I don't see, well, then I'm going to say that God's not faithful. Time. Time is one of the greatest enemies of faith. Time. You know what happens is when you have time, have you ever had this conversation with before when somebody wants to talk to you uh, and, and maybe it's this in-depth conversation, and, and, but yet you've got a lot of things going on, you would say, I don't have to talk, right? But when you have time, when you have time, or when time is the thing that you're very mindful of, or you, 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 you can enter some conversations that you shouldn't be in. We're, we're looking here, I'll, 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 I want to show you, let me finish here, uh, no, let me go here, let me go to Galatians let me go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 7 this morning. It says, you were running a good race. You were running such a good race. He's talking about faith here. This is Paul writing to the church at Galatia. He's saying, uh, talking about how they, they move back to the works of the law and, and, you, and, and away from uh, grace by being saved. The verse right before that, it says that none of these things matter, only faith that works through love. Okay. And then he goes on to say, you were running such a good race. You were running such a good race. Anybody ever start out and you're running so good until something gets cut in. Something that says, but who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Who cut in on you to keep you from continuing in what you once believed? That's that word obey. Who, it's not just you obeying. It's who cut in on you to keep you or to interrupt you from what you once held as a conviction? Now, this picture of this, this, this word picture, who cut in on you? I want you to think about running around a track, right? Like collegiate or Olympic sports. It's, it's not the, uh, the 100 where everybody's in their lane. Let's go to the 1600 meter. If you don't know how this works, this works where when you start out the first lap, everybody has to stay in their lane until they get to a certain point. But after that, it's just run around the track. And so what you'll notice is the lanes that were like this, they get, they get like this, and now they're running, and they're, you'll see the, 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 the people kind of get kind of um, uh, or jammed up, so to speak, where, where the, I mean, feet are right next to each other. And they're going, and they're going, and, and they're on the 800. And this guy, maybe from the back, he's trying to pass. But if you're going to pass on the outside, you've got to run a lot faster because you've got to, you're actually covering more distance. So the place that you're going to pass is on the straightaway because your extra speed is not taken away from you on the corner where you've got to run like twice as far. So what happens is, 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 is things get, get compacted. It's like a traffic jam around the racetrack. Have you ever seen this, right? But have you ever seen it where when, when somebody's running, uh, maybe there's some animosity. You know, on the first lap, somebody kind of bumped shoulders a little bit. And, you know, you kind of maybe saw the scowl. I don't know if you've ever watched this happen. But someone gets a little bit of a scowl on their face as they're still running. Like, what are you doing? Trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm in this spot, right? 
And the next, as they go around, that, that person that's behind, they try to pass them again. But this person, rather than running their race, they decide to kind of, you're not passing me, they kind of NASCAR bring it over a little bit, and it causes a little bit of interruption. And now what's happened is, on lap two, lap three, they're not running for the finish line. That this is not, they, the finish line is not what's in their mind. What's in their mind? The race that they're running is this guy right here. And their eyes have left the line of where you're running and what we're, we're to be pleasing and what we're to be running towards. Again, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. We, we, we read that, but let's go back. That's Hebrews 11 or 12, 1. But let's go back to Hebrews 11, 6. Now, this, now without faith, it's impossible to please God. Like this is, we're, we're no longer concerned about the finish about just, uh, just coming under his word and, and saying that, that, that faith is, my faith is actually to please the Lord, not to get me something. My faith is to please the Lord, not to get me something. And my eyes move off of the finish, that which is pleasing to the Lord, to what's going on in my life and what's happening here. He says, you were running so well, Galatians 5 Seven, you were running so well. Who cut in on you? Let me ask you this. It, what do you think could cut in on you to cause you or to interrupt your race, your faith race? Could it be a condition? Could it be uh, a, an opposing word that causes you and I to disengage with where we're going because of what's going on here in the moment? Could it be what's right now here in the moment or this very second can I say time? What happened right now can so often cause you and I to, to, to have our race interrupted. So what does it look like to, to continue to run well? Because again, God wants you and I to run all the way to the finish and, and run the race that's set before us, right? Uh, it, let me finish this, Galatians 5, 7, and we'll jump back to Romans 4. It says, who, you were running a good race. Who cut in? Who blocked you? Who cut you off? And changed your focus. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? What does it mean to obey? Again, it's the, proper, it's the, it's the result of a God persuasion that you and I, uh, like Paul says, you, you tell me about your faith, I'll show it to you by what I do. In other words, when I believe something and I'm in faith, there's an, a corresponding action. He said, what, what has interrupted your corresponding action? You're, what's happened is, it's not that you maybe aren't going to continue to run, but something has stopped you. So that's actually the picture here. It, 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 the picture I gave you with this race running around like that, when they're kind of elbow bumping and kind of cutting in, how many of you know, they're, even, even though they're kind of elbow bumping and whatnot, they're still running. But this picture is like you just paused. You just paused your race. We just paused. Something cut in on us, and we just stopped for a moment. You know why we stopped? Well, it's the same reason that we have to, if we're, if we're running and we're trying to get a clear view or a clear focus at something, we have to stop so we can look a little clearer and make sure that we're seeing accurately. You, you ever been there? You, you, you're, you're running, and you're like, wait, i got to see you accurately. So you pause so you can see accurately. You know, with the words that are spoken, we've talked about this, that, that faith is not of the eyes. Faith is of the heart. And this is how God, uh, this is how salvation comes to, to, to people. This is, we talked about this in, in maybe week one or week two, how the Lord, uh, he, week two, where the Lord is getting us to transition from having been and experienced him by our senses to, to relating with him and with our heart. On the road to Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us? The Holy Spirit, he says, he bears witness with our spirit, our inner man, that we're a child of God. He wants you and I to relate here. You know what's crazy? I can be running and I can see here while everything's still going here. But if I'm using these, i got to stop. The car. i got to stop to see clearly what these senses. And what happens is I begin to assess based on what I see out here instead of what I know in here. Can I tell you, when you stop and look, when you stop and look, it's kind of like uh, uh, Lot's wife. 
You, you, you and I stopping to look and assess, we might just stay there. We just might stay right there instead of not entering that conversation but staying in the conversation who is the author and the finisher of our faith and say, no, you said, thank you, Lord. You said, and I stay with the you said, and I stay with the you said. You know what I find? I find that I advance from that place where all of those things were talking. I, I move, move further on, so to speak, down the track, and that is not, not a conversation anymore. You know what's crazy? You ever been in that place of worry? Only to find out the next day you spent all that time worrying about wasn't even going to happen. You just got robbed from a portion of your day. You Googled, you blah, blah, blah. You shirred up all of these things for something that wasn't even yet. You stopped your race. And so to speak, your progress was delayed and you stopped. And, and now you can get back on. But, but what we really need to do, if that stopped us, we need to strengthen the word that's in our heart. If I'm going to finish the race, I've got to strengthen the word that's in my heart. Well, here's the deal. The Bible tells us in Roman, or excuse me, Proverbs chapter 4 to guard your heart. You know, there's gateways to your heart. There's gateways or there's paths to your heart. It's in your eyes and in your ears. And you get it into your heart and out of your mouth. But you know, even your mouth, when you and I put God's word in our mouth, in order to put it in our mouth, it's going to have to be probably before our eyes, or we're going to have to have it in our ears, or by putting it in our mouth, we're going to get it in our ears. And so therefore, it's going to get it in our heart. This is what God was doing with Abram and Sarai when he changed their name to where they had to agree and speak continually God's part, but God's part, but God's part, but God's part. I'm a father of many nations. What are you talking about, buddy? You can't even have a kid with your own wife. You're a fool. You're a fool. You don't think there's, there's some persecution to walk in faith? There's some, there, there, there will be, if you are going to walk in faith and you're going to declare, I'm Abraham, because see, faith speaks. Faith speaks. Don't tell me you're in faith when your mouth is shut. Guess what? People are going to know your name's Abraham if you're in faith. People are going to know that you're believing God for, for it might be, let's say you, you rolled your ankle. And you believe in God to have that ankle healed, but they're saying you're going to be in a cast for three months. You can fight the fight of faith or you can wait three months. But if you're going to fight the fight of faith, what you're going to say is that God's working in my ankle. God's say, how's it going? Man, God's working in my ankle. He, by his stripes, I'm healed. There's no weapon formed against me that's prospering. So your fight of faith, you're, going to, you're saying that's faith? I am saying that's faith. I'm, say, I'm not saying it. The word of God is saying it, that that's faith. I'm, I'm coming under the word of God, even though I don't feel like it. I'm coming under the word of God, even though it doesn't look like it. I'm coming under the word of God, even though I don't want it to look like this in front of you. I don't care. My goal in faith is not to get my ankle healed. It's to please the Lord. So guess what I say? That by his stripes, I am healed. You know what that does? That pleases the Lord. Yeah, but, 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 what, if, but what if, what if, what if I, what if it does, what if, uh, what if you please the Lord? What if you please the Lord concerning your finances and by faith you declare the word of God over your finances and I declare over my thing, family by faith and in, in, in this house, God's pleased. Because faith words exist in this house. And where faith words exist in, in, in a house, God can apply or, in a sense, get grace to you. Keep the conduit, the channel, the pathway, the bridge up. Instead of letting things get cut in, constantly cut up, the bridge is out. The bridge is out. You know, after a while, thank God he remains faithful. But after a while, if you go to the same road over and over and over again and the bridge is out, you start taking a different way. Thank God he remains faithful. But if you want traffic, let me say that this way, if you want grace traffic into your life, keep the bridge of faith open. How do you keep the bridge of faith open? You recognize that faith is not about pleasing yourself. 
It's about pleasing God. And you'll be able to stay in the race a whole lot longer because you're not thinking about, well, my side hurts. No, you're thinking about the finish. You're thinking about those who are, are Hebrews chapter 12. He says, let us lay aside every weight that so easily encumbers us. Let us lay that aside because there's those watching. There's those watching around. There's a cloud of witnesses. Lay all that aside. And let us run with continuance, with patience to continue. Put it forward, forward, the race that's set before us. And then what does he say? Don't look at yourself. Get your eyes off of yourself. But instead, if you're going to run and not be interrupted and cut off in the race, fix your eyes. Look unto Jesus. The one that, he's the one that came to you with the word. He, I, this wasn't your idea. He, the, the promise of the gospel and the good news and healing, that was in this. That was in this. That wasn't a pastor. That was in this. That was the author. Like He could have left that portion out. He said, the, you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He said, these signs that will follow those that believe. He said it. I didn't say it. He said it. If he's the author, then, then he's the one that's accountable for it. But my portion is, is to stay in that place of running. And the way I do that is I, I get my eyes off of me and thinking that faith is all about me and pleasing me. But it's about coming under the Lord and pleasing the Lord. I'm a servant of God, the Most High. And so what I do as a servant, I come under what he says, no matter how I feel or what I see. And when I'm struggling to run my race, I, I, I remember those that, are, that I'm running in front of, but I, I, I take and I fix my eyes and I look to Jesus, the author and finisher uh, of, of my faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You and I are going to have to, this piece right here, despising the shame. To run the race, to follow Christ, and to walk in faith, and to stay under what the word of God says, whatever it is you're facing, you're going to have to learn to think less of shame. To carry the message of Christ to your kid, your, 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 the students at school. Like, I think one day we're going to want to get into heaven, and we're going to be like, Jesus, no, it's Jesus. I call on him. But right now, that's, let's, let's make sure that we are shouting his voice, shouting his name like we will one day. How do I do that? i got to think less of the shame. i got to think, I mean, you know how you think less of the shame? You think less of your name. That's how you think less of shame. You think less of your name. You think less of, like, uh, how, how, how you look in the situation. Thank you, Lord. Less of my name. Less of Nate. More of him. Oh, just to be pleasing to you, Lord. Just to be pleasing to you. You know what pleases him? Faith. You know what pleases him? Coming under his word no matter what you see or how you feel. Saying, Lord, you said. And so when I come under his word, I agree with his word. When I agree with his word, I speak his word. I come into agreement. I come into agreement. So he says, um, uh, who has obeyed you? Again, back to Galatians 5, 7 through 9. He says, you were running your race good. Who cut in? Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. What is it? That word persuasion there is used only to sell, uh, of self-produced persuasion. This word here, the only place you ever see it in, in the Bible is it's being convinced, but nobody else was talking to you, but you talking to you. It's this inward conversation or this conversation right here that you and I, we, we, we get in on, but it's not from the Lord, and we're looking at, and we're thinking, and we're, and we're trying to reason, and reason, and reason, and it's actually evil. I want you to see, I, I, I think uh, we're going to close with this I, uh, this morning. After we go back to Romans, we're going to close with only one portion of, um, of, of what, with the right portion. 
He says, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. He said, a little yeast, again, back to Galatians 5, 9, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. You've heard it said like this, a little leaven spoils the whole loaf. So we're talking about faith. We're talking about finishing it to the end. Um, so many times what, what we don't recognize while we're trying to be in faith, we don't recognize the unbelief portion in our lives. The unbelief portion in our lives, it causes a rise to a lot of things, just like that yeast. It causes things in our life. It affects the whole loaf. That yeast affects the whole loaf. The unbelief, it affects the whole, our whole race. The unbelief affects the whole race. It affects how you run. It affects how I run. It affects, it affects everything. And so back to Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 18 now. Who against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of nations, according to that which was spoken. What did he believe? He believed according to what? That which was spoken. This is faith. You and I believe according to that which is spoken. This is why if you and I say, well, I'm just believing, and you don't have anything that God has spoken, you don't have faith, you don't have something to stand on, you're on sand, not a rock. You have nothing to grab a hold of and lock in on, so to speak, and say, no, I'm not moving off of this word. I'm not moving off of the word that he said he's going to make me a father of many nations. I'm not moving off of Sarah. We, I could go back and call her Sarai, but I'm not. It's Sarah. I'm not moving back to Abram. It's Abraham. I'm the father of many nations, and it's not coming through the works of my hand. I said, God, you could do it through, how about Ishmael? I mean, come on. He said, no, no, no. I'm going to do it through Isaac because it's going to be what I said, and you're going to recognize this is the way I work. If you'll come under this word and you'll partner with me and you'll call yourself Abraham, if you'll partner with me and call her Sarah, then you can partner with me and you will receive that which will produce laughter in your life. And you'll go, wow, God, you do what I couldn't do, though you raise the dead. You raise the dead and you call those things into being that are not as though they were in my countenance, my joy, my testimony in my house and whom you cut covenant with is one who laughs. Like, like there is a joy in faith. You know how you and I run and we're going to run all the way to the end? It's when we're not like, oh, I'm just so done and ready to be done. If that is your, if that's coming out of your mouth, you will not finish well. But when you get tired, when you get wore out, instead you look back to Jesus who the joy set before him, which was me, he loved me. Father, thank you, thank you. Joy, joy, a, a roar of, on the inside. The Bible says that it's the joy of the Lord that is a strength to us. If you're tired, you gotta get back before you joy. Back before you joy, and that joy is that God saw you. Oh, he, he saw me? That's my joy. My joy needs to, that's its foundation, that God saw me. Oh, Father, thank you that you saw me and that you came and you endured the cross. You didn't care what it looked like, all the sin, all the nasty, the stuff, your skeletons in the closet were openly displayed on Jesus. Your skeleton, like the skeletons that nobody knows about, they were openly displayed and placed on Jesus. And he paid the price and he took those, and he took the punishment. Wow. Who against hope believed in hope that he might be the father of nations according to that which was spoken. So he believed according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And not being, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old. Neither did he. Uh, consider uh, the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not. So here, he, this whole verse, verses 19 and 20, uh, to the beginning of 20, he's just talking about being strong in faith is based on not considering an opposing word. Not entering the conversation that it opposes what God says. It, it truly is that picture of um, like uh, having illicit love affairs. Like there's, there's a very descriptive the people of God having illicit love affairs with the world. When you and I, so to speak, 
enter intimate conversation with all of the outside when God, the love of my life, said this. And now I'm over here having intimate conversation over here. That is truly an affair. It, that's an affair with, with the world. So when I consider, when I consider the opposing word, you could call an affair somebody being un... Okay. Being unfaithful. By, by, be, by, by considering the opposing word, what, what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm having an affair or I'm being unfaithful to the Lord. Let me ask you this. If, if you were like that with your, your spouse, would that please them? When you have opportunity, you have opportunity. No one will know. No one will know that what's going on. I mean, you can go on upstairs. You can go off with that girl. You can go, no one's going to know. But it's when you have opportunity because the conditions are right, and yet you say, this is my wife, and I'm not going there. They're pleased. You know, when the conditions are right, to say, I don't, it doesn't look like what you said, God. I'm just going to go do a little tango over here with unbelief, with some unfaithfulness, with the conditions, because the conditions are right. I'm, I'm being unfaithful to the Lord. But I could, when the opportunity and the conditions are right, to say, it doesn't look like I'm going to make it this month. It doesn't look like my kids are turning out the way. It doesn't look like my marriage. It doesn't look like. It doesn't look like. And da 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 da. And something cuts in on me. Just boom. In the middle of I'm running my race, man. I'm going good. All of a sudden, so what in the world? What what? I, I decide to not even enter that conversation. I just keep my eyes on the one. I say, I'm God. You said, thank you, Lord, Father. Thank you, Lord. I'm here to please you. I'm. I had an opportunity. I had opportunity. No one would ever know. I could have bowed out for a little bit and kept that on. But no, 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 no. I want to please the Lord. I want to please the Lord. This is faith. Pleasing the Lord. I want to please the Lord. I want to please the Lord. I want to please the Lord. That is faith. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. So the, the, the first portion there, staggering not, I just want to I wanna, I give a couple of verses on that, um, and that's what I wanted to close with uh, today. And I wanted to give um, a few, it's further down in my notes, Matthew 16, 2 through 4, if you're, well, we'll go ahead uh, and just start here. He says, uh, Matthew 16, 2 through 4, he replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather. And why do you say it'll be fair weather? Because the sky's red. You know, pink sky at night. Somebody finish it. Pink sky at night. Pink sky in morning. Oh, wow, you guys are great. Somebody taught you that. Somebody taught you to look at the sky and to be able to determine tomorrow. So it'll be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret. Is that what this says? You know how to interpret. Okay? Now this, we're going to go through three scriptures. This is English words, but sometimes we miss, we miss what's actually going on here. We know how to interpret. We know how to look at a circumstance and make a judgment call. He says, you know how to interpret. He says... Um, Today it'll be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. So he even gave people the signs of the times. You know, we're going to have it here in a, a couple of weeks. We're, uh, Joseph Morris is going to be here. He's, uh, you know, um, anointed to teach on end times, right? And, and there's signs, right? But the Bible says that we, we are not led by signs. Yeah, there's signs for the, really for the unbeliever because they're led on the outside. Carnality. Carnal being natural man. But you and I, we're, we're led here. We're, we know here, 
right? So this is when the word of God is taught, or when somebody says, what, what day in which we're living in the Lord's return, where do you check? CNN? Google? Here. Yeah, we're, we're closer. Yeah. Okay? And he says, you know how to interpret the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he said, really, the signs are not what you and I are to be looking for. That's what the wicked look for, signs. And God's, God's mercy gives them signs. It's his mercy to show them that what I said, you can see with these eyes. But the children of God, the Bible says the righteous are led by the Spirit of God. This is how you and I are led. Okay? So again, I wanna, we're talking about this word, you know how to interpret, to look at the appearance of the sky and make a judgment call what tomorrow will be. You're going to bring your umbrella because you saw the pink sky this morning. You know what's going to be. Okay? Mark 11, 22 through 25. Now he says, have faith in God. Okay? And we're, gonna, we're, we're talking about this word, interpret. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but rather believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. I want to stop right there. That word doubt is the same word as interpret. How do you get doubt in your heart when you look at the signs to determine and make the call what will be? This is doubt, is the interpretation by natural means. You and I, our, our race is interrupted and we don't run to the finish when, when we're interrupted and we make a judgment call of what tomorrow will be by natural means. God calls those things that you do not see as though they are. If you and I will stay in the place of faith and be pleasing to the Lord, you know what you and I will be doing? We'll be calling some things that are not yet as though they are. Abraham. You're not a father of many nations. Abraham. That's my name. You call me Abraham. I like it when they call me Abraham. Right? And this is Sarah. Princess of nations? She doesn't even have a child. No, this is Sarah, princess of nations. This is Sarah. You know why? Because i got a covenant with God. You know what you and I have? Again, if you go read Genesis 17, God cut covenant with them. And he said, I cut covenant with you. I cut covenant with you in Genesis 15. I came down and I gave you my word. But you haven't given, given me your word. You haven't been giving me your word. You're out there trying to please yourself. I need you to give me your word. He said, you know what I need you to do? I need you to circumcise all of your people in your house, you included. Give me your word. You make a covenant. I made a covenant. You make a covenant. Make a covenant. Put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. And don't look at what you see to interpret tomorrow. That's how doubt enters James 1.6. But he must ask in faith without wavering. It's the same exact word as to interpret, to waver, to go, ooh, I don't know. I mean, it looks like this. I know God said this, but it looks like this. So you and I, when we pray, when we ask in faith, we're to ask in faith without looking at James 1, 6. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Okay, so the NIV says not doubt. King James says without wavering. I don't know, what does the ESV say? The picture here is that you and I would look. We'd ask, but we would look. We would ask, but we would look. If I ask the Lord and I look at the conditions what I'm doing is I'm opening myself up to doubt. Am I saying stick your head in the stand? No, I'm saying fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who loves you so much and did not spare his own son. How will he not also freely give you all things? So guess what? If you're going to be strong in faith, you're going to have to stagger not at the, at the promises of God through unbelief. How do I stagger? When I look at the conditions and I think that that's what tomorrow is going to hold because it looks like this. 
How many times are we fooled because it looks like this and we begin to make a contingency plan only to see that it didn't even happen and we just wasted this time? Well, God loves you. He's thinking about you. He knows the end from the beginning. He, he, Matthew chapter 6, he knows what you care about. He cares for the birds and he cares for the flowers. How much more does he care for you? But only seek first. Seek only the kingdom of God which is his, his way of doing, his way of being, kingdom. The place which God's word rules, kingdom. But only, only what God's word says over this situation. And all those things, he said, you won't have to please yourself with them. I'll add them to you. See, a good father doesn't make you have to get everything for yourself. They just think, I bet he'd like that. I bet he liked one of those. That's how a good father thinks. And that's how our father thinks. Let's keep faith to the finish. All the way to the end. So this is the word I just had. Uh, I wrote it uh, at the beginning because it just is like the Lord's like, declare this to the people today. All the way to the finish, you run your race. All the way to the finish, you run your race. You run your race. All the way to the finish. That, that conversation that the Lord, he, he brought it back. All the way to the finish. The cut in. All the way to the finish. You run your race. And it's the race of faith. All the way to the finish. I'm running my race. So this is your partnership. This is Abraham. This is Sarah. This is, this is you can call me you can call me Abraham. All the way to the finish, I'll run my race. All the way to the finish, I'll run my race. You know what? He's watching. I can't tell you how many times I've told my kids this. What blesses me more than anything is not first place. It's just watching the heart with which you play. When you give it your all, how many of you know what I'm talking about? When you see your kids just giving it their all, are, what are you? You're pleased. You're pleased. First place kind of actually has the wrong thing where you, it makes you proud. Makes you proud. But when you see a child give all of their heart, what does it do? <sighs> Pleases you. Go get them, bud. Go get, I'll be there for that any day. I'll be there for that every day. It pleases me when you, God's wanting to be pleased by you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand this morning. You run your race all the way to the finish. You might say, I'm running my race. All the way to the finish. So the race, it could be, quote unquote, the fight of faith. You know, you'll be, right now there's, you're in a race that you, you're going to get to finish and then you're going to start another one. It's kind of like ball games. It's like, chalk that one up. Chalk that one up. Chalk that one up. But I'm going to win. You know why? Because this is 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory that overcomes in this world. My faith. I'm going to win. You know how it's going to go down in my column? Hero. Hero. It's going to come down with an H. A hero of faith. It's going to come down with a God story. The in my life. The but God. But God. But God, that's how it's coming down. Whether I see it or not, it's coming down as an H in my column. A God portion, a God portion, a God portion, a God, but God, but God. That's my testimony, but God, but God. He came in, he came in, he came with Jesus, but God, he came in, he interrupted. And that's my story. And my story is one of victory, amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for your word to us your kindness and your love. We thank you that we have eyes that see, eyes of the heart that see, and ears of our heart that hear. Lord, where we've been hardened, where we've been hard and stout against your word because of the conditions of life, the opportunity right now to, to repent. Lord, if we've been hard because of what we've seen, what we've experienced. We repent. 
We come under your word to please you. That you would be glorified in our life. Be glorified. Where we've been ashamed of you. Where we've been ashamed of you. We say today, I'm not ashamed of you anymore. Tell them, I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not, I don't think less of you and more of others. I think more of you and less of shame. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for your word. Clear words today being deposited in hearts concerning the race that we're running. And we just say we come under your word. That's your, your choice. I say this morning, you might say it if that's what you're saying. I come under your word today concerning my body. I come under your word today concerning my destiny. I can come under your word today concerning my family and my future. I come under your word today that you would be pleased. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, this is a great opportunity. The Lord brought you here to make sure you would know that heaven is your home. The Bible says it's not your works that get you to heaven. It's believing on Jesus and receiving him as your Lord and Savior. If that's you this morning, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, and you want to know, make sure today that heaven's your home, I want you to lift your hand right where you're at, right where you're at. Anybody here this morning that doesn't know where they'd spend eternity? Thank you, Lord. No hand. Thank you for your hand, honey. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, um, I don't do this real often, but sometimes an invitation like that goes forth. And um, what also goes along with that is somebody, you've been, you've been born again. But what you right now have been battling is condemnation, like severe condemnation. And you know you got to get right with God. And so just with your heads bowed and your eye closed, eyes closed, if you, this is a call, and what, what's been ridiculing you is shame. Shame has been speaking. And, um, and so God is a God uh, of love. And, and so in this moment, I just it had heard in my heart, I want you to uh, erase the shame even in this moment by having them close their eyes and bow their heads. And I, if that's you this morning, you have been battling shame and you've got to get your heart right with the Lord, I want you to lift your hand right where you're at. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Thank you, honey. God loves you. He loves you and he sent Jesus. So if you raise your hand on either of those occasions, I want you to pray this prayer and mean it from your heart right here. Eyes up. Look at me. Just say, Father, today I come to you believing that you sent your son Jesus for me. Because you love me. You paid the price for my sins. Right now, I receive your love. I receive your son Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior. Thank you for saving me, for loving me, for directing me all the days of my life. I declare Jesus is my Lord forever. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, if you prayed the prayer for the first time or you just want some, just some good material, right? You know, when you're, when you're ridiculed with, with shame or you're ridiculed over and over, it's sometimes just good to have a conversation and let somebody strengthen you in the word of God towards you. Amen? Amen. Otherwise, uh, we're going to dismiss then, and then we'll see you guys Wednesday night.
uh, coming up. And other than that, we'll see you later. Have a great week. <laughs>